Hey guys, what's happening? So today I'm going to explain a phenomenon that we see and talk about a decent amount when we're talking microscopy, particularly transmission electron microscopy. This response to a question a friend had on Mastodon. You can follow me over there if you want. You're smart, you can figure out how to find me. Uh, but basically the question was, the imperfections in a microscope spread out the features we have in our image. Um, but it doesn't treat all image features the same. So lower resolution or larger features get spread out less and high resolution features get spread out more. And to illustrate what the basis of the problem is that I'm talking about, if you look at this image without any kind of scale bar or reference, the blob in the center is a gold fiducial marker. It's about a nanometer in size. And you've got these white lobes or side brand bands sticking out. And what those are, are a blurred version of the um, roughly two angstrom spacing that you get in small. So even though it's an amorphous gold bead, there's small regions of crystalline order. Uh, and the reason to show that is because they're crystalline, they add together and you get brightness that stands out from the background. Uh, this shouldn't be confused about the fact that this happens with spatial, or, sorry, with features that are non-ordered. Uh, it's just hard to see in the noise in the background. Uh, because that's just the nature of our lot. Uh, anyway, so you can see that these features, which originate from a two angstrom feature, so they, if we had a nice high mag image, what we'd be seeing in those spots are some bright planes that are evenly spaced. Uh, our pixel sampling is too low here to see the two angstrom spacing, and so what we've done is we've effectively blurred it. Um, by subsampling the image. So what we really see is something more like blurry waves that are at best about four angstrom spaced. This is a two angstrom pixel image. And then on top of that, because everything is, you know, when you have something that's a wave of two, you can also fit things that are a wave of four or eight or whatever. Um, so why do these high resolution features get pushed out more by the point spread function than the low resolution? That's exactly what we're trying to try to get at today. So we're dealing with a case where we talk about the CTF for the phase contrast transfer function in Fourier space. And that's because we image typically under conditions that are both periaxial, peri, periaxial geez, and isoplanatic. So the image formation process can be treated both as a linear perturbation onto the wave function and that linear perturbation can be handled as if it were a convolution, which means in Fourier space, we can treat it as a multiplication because they're um, dual spaces. If that sounded like a bunch of gibberish, that's fine. All we need to worry about is that convolution in real space is what we're going to talk about. And it's effectively like a sliding dot product. If you aren't familiar with what convolution is, just pause this, jump over to Wikipedia. They've got a couple nice animations showing how, you know, convolving a box with a box gives you something that looks like a triangle. Um, so I'll wait a second, go ahead and do that. All right. So what you now understand is that although we could write out the math, effectively what you're doing is you're taking one function, you multiply it by another function, pixel wise, add up all those elements, put that in the central pixel of that image, step over one, repeat the process. And that's what we got when we're doing convolution. So to give you a sense of what the point spread function looks like in real space, because we're used to seeing the CTF in uh, reciprocal space, which let's say we've got spatial frequency here. You'd have something that maybe dips down like this and then goes down and then oscillates and it does this thing, right? So what does that look like in real space? So wrote part of this book chapter a while back um, on CTF image estimation and image restoration. Uh, the rest of the book is more interesting than our piece, but if you're interested, you can go check it out there. But this figure, I think, captures it nicely. So even though this isn't a microscopy image, what I did is I found, in this case, this uh, image that has a artifact. We've got a bright pixel. It's effectively a unit impulse. So if this is, I guess, X, we're talking in real space. It's got something that's maybe a value of one here um, and a dark background. So what happens when you convolve a unit impulse with any other function is you get back that function. So what that means is if I apply the point spread function of the microscope to this image, you see these ripples out here, that's effectively we're capturing what does this point spread function look like in real space. Um, so effectively, 
and you have to forgive my drawing here. What we've got is something that looks roughly like an airy disk. Uh, it's inverted. We don't really care about that right now because we're talking generalities here. Uh, but I want to point out a couple features um, because here I'm showing you how this brought out the point spread function, but what we're concerned about is what does this point spread function do to the point? You know, it's what you're seeing here in this case is a single pixel sized image feature, how it's spread out. Um, but what we're concerned about is, you know, flipping back to that gold bead, which I guess maybe my slides won't let me do. Uh, remember those fringes got pushed outside the particle. And so the easiest way I can explain this is instead of thinking of the convolution, let's take each sort of stepwise, uh, pixelwise multiplication and sum and look at what might happen. So if we've got our gold bead here, which is composed internally of these, let's just assume it's actually ordered and not amorphous. And then the whole bead itself has this strong low frequency component because it uh, scatters electrons very strongly. So when the point spread function is being convolved with the image, let's just say we're at the step where it's at sitting at this point, what's going to happen? So we're multiplying everything that is of this size by this relatively uniform function. So we're basically going to get the average of everything in the bead at low resolution and add it to the central point right here. So all the value of this convolution is going to end up in that pixel. And then we get some little bits from outside the bead that get moved into the bead, right? So that's mostly going to look like what is the average of the bead? That's really the net outcome. So we're going to get something that looks like this. That's nice and dark, which is exactly what we saw on the image in the first slide. And then we're going to grab some little image intensities from outside the bead and add them on top of this. So we get a nice strong dark background with a little bit of salt and pepper on top of it. But that's where your strong low resolution comes from. So you may ask yourself, all right, get to the point. How does the high resolution image information from the bead end up outside the bead? Well, if we now skip, you know, let's say 50 pixels and we end up over here. Now our point spread function during this convolution process is over here, right? So what are we getting? Well, if you go back to that image, that outside the bead was mostly salt and pepper noise. So let's just assume it's a bunch of plus ones and negative ones, right? So this interior lobe that when it was over our bead gave us a nice strong dark contrast is now going to basically give us an average of those plus and negative ones. So we're going to get a flat background, just zero. Now on top of that, it's got these small lobes and the size of the lobes is going to matter for what type of image features it's grabbing. Uh, we, the details aren't real important here, but let's say that these happen to be spaced roughly so that the width of these lobes is something like two angstroms. In that case, it can grab these beads, or sorry, these planes, these bright fringes without blurring them. And it just says, okay, multiply this times this, which is, let's say, for the sake of our argument, keeping it simple again, that the bright fringes are one and in between the fringes are negative one as well. So now at this point, we're gonna add up the fringes here and we're gonna go with this flat background and it grabs a fringe and it's gonna add that on top of the flat background. So effectively, in a very hand wavy way, at this point outside of the bead, we get these fringes here. And I guess I shouldn't have drawn, let's just erase this because that's a little confusing. Um, what I should have done is drawn that guy. Let's make the highlighter. That should have been drawn here, right? So we get this low resolution bit here when we're convolving the point spread function here because it's effectively the average over the bead which is the only strong thing outside of noise. And we get the little salt and pepper on top of it from these regions out here. We then step the point spread function over because we're doing convolution. And now we're smoothing out the background over here and we're grabbing these bright fringes from inside the bead. And that's why they end up over here because that convolution always puts its result over where the center of that function is. Then we slide over some more lather, rinse, and repeat. So this was just to avoid a lot of typing on Mastodon. I know that probably this hopefully didn't make you more confused than when I started. Uh, if you want me to take another crack at it, happy to. Put any questions down in the comments, blah, blah. Y'all know how to use the internet. Yeah.